Good evening, everybody. My name is Jay Wyatt. I'm the Assistant Director at the Center for Legislative Archives here at the National Archives. Welcome. Thanks for spending your evening with us for this event. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to our program, uh, Keeping the Republic a Defense of American Constitutionalism. This evening's program is part of our Road to Revolution series here at the Archives. The Road to Revolution is a rotating exhibit in our West Rotunda Gallery, which is on the other side of the building, and that commemorates our nation's upcoming 250th anniversary. The exhibit highlights National Archives records that document major milestones and critical historical context to the American Revolution, to the Revolutionary War, and ultimately to the adoption of the Declaration of Independence. An important part of this story, of course, is the creation and ratification of the United States Constitution. Tonight, the authors of Keeping the Republic, Dennis Hale and Mark Landry, and the archivist of the United States, Dr. Colleen Shogun, will discuss how the Constitution safeguards freedom by limiting the exercise of power. Dennis Hale is Associate Professor of Political Science at Boston College and the author of Jury in America, Triumph and Decline, and the editor of three other volumes, Mark Landy is professor of political science at Boston College and co-author of Presidential Greatness in the Environmental Protection Act, Asking the Wrong Questions from Nixon to Clinton. They will be available for a book signing following tonight's discussion. Please welcome Dennis Hale and Mark Landy. And now I will turn it over to the Archivist of the United States, Dr. Colleen Shogun. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for being here. This is a really special evening for me because uh, I uh, attended Boston College. I'm a graduate of Boston College and a product of the political science department. So uh, a lot of what I think about the Constitution, about the Declaration, about the origins of American government, a lot of it comes to me from the professors that taught me at BC, of course, Professor Landy and Professor Hale. So I'm so excited to be here this evening to talk with them. And I'm gonna be asking them questions this evening, which is, feels really good because they asked me a lot of <laughs> questions uh, when I was a student, but now the tables are turned. So uh, you know uh, we'll, that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, so thank you for being here this evening. And, and this is the book, Keeping the Republic, uh, Defense of uh, the American Constitution and American Constitutionalism. So uh, let's just start out with something basic. Tell us why you decided to write this book at this moment in time. Okay, well, there was, a, I think, a, a very um, time li a sort of time-limited purpose and then a broader purpose. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you who read the New York Times uh, and other publications, there is now an industry of law professors mainly, but political scientists, some journalists as well, some members of the American Political Science Association, who get up every morning to attack the Constitution. That seems to be their, uh, their obsession. It's obsolete, it's anti-democratic, um, it's broken, did, did I cover all the yeah, well, adjectives? That, that, that's about it, yeah. I mean, <laughs> the most extreme was a, of, a, a headline in the New York Times by two law professors, one from Harvard, one from Yale, saying the Constitution is broken and cannot be redeemed. So not only does it have flaws, but we should tear it up. Well, frankly, that just made both of us crazy. I mean, we just said to ourselves, come on, don't you understand what is the glue for this republic? So it's always good to start with anger, but then you have to temper your anger and you have to say, well, what is it that we think is so good about the Constitution? And so the bulk of the, the, the these law professors got us going, but the b bulk of the book is a much, much more serious reflection on the importance <clears throat> of the Constitution. And the, and the critical question here is the question that you would have to ask of all forms of government. Um, uh, is that form of government limited or is it unlimited? If it's limited, then that means the people who are running the government can't do everything they want to do um, because it would be illegal. <laughs> what an inconvenience. 
Uh, and uh, in the past, I think most American statesmen understood that they had to, this, was, this was the reality they lived with, and they, you know, and they moved on. Whatever politicians might think, these days, people who comment on the Constitution, people, a lot of them law, law professors, have decided that it might actually be possible to scrap the Constitution. Um, this is no, this is, for them, this is no longer um, uh, an idle thought, but something that might actually happen someday. And, and, and therefore, their commentary on the Constitution, uh, in a sense, anticipates uh, a new Constitution or, or a government in some way that has no uh, constitutional limits. Now, if you, if you sat them down and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, they would not say, oh, of course, I don't believe in unlimited majority rule. And they don't but they're tempted. And they're tempted because they think they're the majority. Now, you would wonder how it comes to be that a group of law professors and political scientists who spend all of their time on campuses talking to each other have suddenly discovered that they are like the majority of the American people. They don't know what they're talking about. And that's the dangerous part. Um, uh, the other dangerous part, of course, is that they, 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 they don't appreciate what it is that the Constitution has substituted for unlimited majority rule. And, and so that's, that's the, I think that's the, the point that we were trying to really nail down in the book. So I, I think some people have probably read the book <clears throat> here, but maybe some haven't. So for those that have not, can you just summarize? We're going to dive in to a lot of different points in the book. But summarize for, for everyone here, what would you say the main thesis? It's a defense of the Constitution, but what would you say your main argument for well, defending the Constitution? Sorry, what is that? Well, yeah, um, the main thesis is that the, the United States is the first modern state. By, by which is meant uh, more or less the following. It's very large, it's very heterogeneous, um, and it's um, filled with people who are rambunctious um, and who don't uh, sit around like you know, English serfs waiting to be told what crops they can plant and, and you know, when they can have children. Um, uh, and for a, for a peop Donald Rumsfeld once was asked a question during the Iraq War, do we have the army we need? And he said, you go to war with the army you got, not the army you wish you had. You create a constitution for the people you got, not for the people you wish you had. And, and, and unlike many other countries, the United States was founded by people who had extensive and deep political, practical political experience among the very people for whom they were now writing this constitution. Yeah. So I, I would just add to, I agree with, obviously agree with everything Dan has said. In addition to rambunctious, I would add enterprising. Mm. No, not all people right. are so enterprising. That's a variable, not a constant. Um, which is why, and this may come up later when we discuss Robert Dahl, mm -hmm. um, this really reinforces Dennis's point about you write a constitution for the people you got. Our, our polity is simply not Switzerland, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, uh, all these wonderful countries that uh, I would say on the whole have an easier time governing themselves, but that's not who we are, right? We're, we're along with India, we're the only really huge super <laughs> size Republican democracy. And uh, that's, awfully, that's awfully tricky. It's one of the reasons that we are such great friends of something that isn't always so popular, which is federalism. Mm -hmm. Country's too big for, on most questions to be governed from this sacred city. <laughs> <laughs> 
Let's talk about one of the early arguments in the book before you get into some of the critiques of the Constitution. You really say, well, what, were the, what was the political thought that influenced those who wrote the Constitution? And this is a great chapter. I found it very, a lot of fun to read because it reminded me a lot of my education at Boston College. A lot of it was very broad-based about looking at a lot of these diverse influences that come to basically be nestled in American constitutionalism. So you write about how the framers were influenced by you know, ancient thought. They took a lot of their, uh, their arguments from ancient thought. They, they took the idea of statecraft from Aristotle. But they knew that they weren't creating a democracy for ancient times, that they were living in the age of the Enlightenment. They had to deal with what was considered to be modernity and the critiques of modernity of ancient political thought. So how did they reconcile this tension between classical beliefs about, you know, about politics um, and those influences, and also Christianity with the critiques which come later, the Enlightenment and, and modernism. She has a PhD in political science. <laughs> <laughs> you want to start, you want me to start? Well, I, I, let's, I, let's start with Montesquieu. Yeah. We all know that Locke and Hobbes are, are um, famously influential uh, on all of you know, 18th century, 19th, early 19th century political thought. But Montesquieu gets more mentions in the Federalist Papers than at the Constitutional Debate than Locke does. And, and that puzzled us, and I, and, and, and I went, we went back to Montesquieu to read again. And, I, and, and it, it becomes pretty clear. Montesquieu was really interested in how you tailor a government for the particular circumstances of the people for who, that you're seeking to govern. And he's got various examples. And he, he, you know, he talks about climate, uh, you know, rainfall patterns, um, uh, habits, of, habits of dress, religious beliefs, all of these, in other words, again, you have to tailor the suit <laughs> for the body it's fitting. Um, and and this, is a, uh, th this is a tricky business. I was going to, but I'm going to go back to Lo Hobbes and Locke, yeah. because you can't really, you can't ignore Hobbes and Locke. Uh, and the biggest, the two big ideas that come from Hobbes and Locke uh, are consent. This, this is the first republic ever based on the consent of the people. It's never happened before. Even the other really interesting republics like Venice and Florence and Athens and Sparta, no. Consent of the, of the people. And that's enshrined in the way the Constitution was ratified. The other big idea is rights. Right? Americans love their rights. We may be the most rights-obsessed people on the planet. Uh, but we owe a lot of that to Hobbes and Locke, who really uh, pioneered the notion that uh, people ha are endowed by, as Jefferson phrased it, endowed by their creator with certain inherent unalienable yeah. rights. What, what did that, I mean, I'm going to push you a little bit about the ancients, because uh, they're also, they're influenced by this idea, this notion that human nature affects the type of government that we have to construct. So that's, that's right. the ancient teaching, right? This is what you get from Aristotle. This is what you're getting when you're reading Plato's Republic, all those. Um, but then, once again, but how do you reconcile that type of argument with a limited government that also respects individualism and, and rights? Well, so this think, is the conundrum, yeah. isn't it? You can those all, things are intention. No, it's not a conundrum. It's, it's a tension, a, though, it, isn't it? It's wonderful. The, the, <laughs> the whole idea of limited government, I think, pays respect mm -hmm. to the idea that comes both from your classics and mm -hmm. also from a biblical uh, understanding. Human nature is flawed. Sorry, guys. We, we, we're people of the body. We have lusts. We have cravings. We have uh, jealousies. Uh, and it was the great undertaking of the founding to figure out how to, how to not contravene those truths and yet also understand the great virtues that people have. 
um, and to create a government that was sensitive to both. It, it did, you know, Madison is famous for saying, if men were angels, we wouldn't need government, but men are not angels. And so our system... And they can't be made into angels. And they can't be made angels. A lot of, part of our book, we contrast uh, the American uh, Republic with the French Revolutionary Republic, right. who thought you could just change everything, change the days of the week, change uh, the months, change human nature. That human nature could be transformed into something just wonderful, just, just you know, hunky-dory. Um, no. Okay. So let's talk about some of, you, you outline in a, a very um, <clears throat> extensive chapter, you outline the, I would say maybe the most known or popular criticisms of the Constitution, and you've already talked about some of uh, the ink that has been spilled in, in uh, criticizing the Constitution or providing um, uh, those critiques of it. So we'll start with the first one, which I think that we, probably everybody in this room would be familiar with, which is that the Constitution is anti-democratic, or, or it's not democratic enough. I mean, it could either, either of those critiques, however you want yeah. to uh, play it. And typically, the two institutions that get attacked most are the Senate and the Electoral College as Always. being the most anti-democratic. There well, may be others, but those well, are the two are the that, are, that are often criticized. So. Tell us a little bit, of, I think we're familiar with those criticisms. What would your answer be, as we're facing an election here in, in just another a week, where we could see an outcome, where the popular vote outcome could, is not the same as the electoral college outcome. How do you reconcile those, that um, desire or that impetus for a democracy, right, versus... Consider this possibility, mm -hmm. and, and Kamala is speaking just up the road somewhere, that Kamala wins the battleground states, gets elected president, and Trump takes the popular vote. It's conceivable. The, the vote for Trump is going up in the blue states, right? That's not gonna win him any electoral votes, but uh, it could happen. And, and that's why I, I want people, so much of the criticism of the electoral college seems to me to be what I would call presentist, right? The two last people to benefit from the um, electoral college versus the popular vote were Bush and Trump. But it can go the other way. Um, and our big argument is that, yeah, of course the Constitution is not fully democratic. So when people attack it for not being fully democratic, all you have to do is say yes because the whole purpose of the Constitution was to mitigate democracy, not to, it's not anti-democratic, it's mitigated democratic, meaning that the Constitution puts, puts up hurdles, but not barriers to the majority. So that's the broad notion. You want to talk specifically? Yeah, about yeah, the, the um, uh, Part of this is, is, involves federalism. In other words, part of this involves the desire of states. Um, at the time the Constitution was written, and, and of course states have, have, have continued to feel this way going forward, uh, not to be um, smothered, uh, small states by the big states, small in population, big in population. Um, and. So the, 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 the idea of giving to the states um, a formal role in the election of the president was, was a way of allaying these fears. Um, so, uh, you know, the original way, as you know, this worked was that state legislatures would choose, appoint electors, an elector, uh, based on the number of, you know, uh, representatives plus two, and they would meet and they would just make up their own mind about who the president should be. Now, it never worked that way, um, uh, but it hasn't been formally changed in, in any s significant way, so um, you still have to pay attention um, to the electoral college votes of states, and um, this was 
This was the reason, this was conceivably why Hillary Clinton lost her election because Bill Clinton, according to stories I've read, was pushing her to spend more time in the Midwest and Northwest states that Obama had carried narrowly because she could win those. And she said no. She didn't want to face the possibility of winning in the Electoral College um, while losing the popular vote because that's what she accused, that's, how she, that's why she criticized um, George Bush. Yeah, I'll make an even more full-throated defense of the Electoral College. This is a huge, diverse country, and it is critical that the person elected president doesn't just have some paper-thin national majority, which uh, Harris could win by just ramping up the coasts and Illinois and a few other places, or that Trump could win by ramping up the South and uh, not, especially the South, but also much bigger uh, votes in the blue states. No, oh, it's, it's appropriate that the election be settled in battleground states, which are the, mo so the most, where the, where the contours of political dis dispute are, are most lively. I think, it's, I think it's very healthy. And there, there are always negatives, right? I live in Massachusetts, it doesn't matter who I vote for at one level. Of course it matters, I mean, it's still, it's still a democratic election. Just because you win by a lot of votes, it, it does force you to play a little bit of uh, uh, trick on yourself and pretend that you matter. But, you know, you do matter. So your vote gets counted. But the main thing is to force the, the candidates out into the hustings where they don't necessarily want to be. Right. And hear all these different disparate views, pay attention to uh, uh, feelings in Pennsylvania now, right? Now both candidates are in favor of fracking. <laughs> Hello? Hello? How what a that, surprise. How did that happen? Do you think that's a predominantly a rep, a small r Republican argument that is more important for the outcome than a small l liberal argument that would be premised on individualism? Every vote is the same, every person's vote is equal. Um, you know, that individualism that we were talking about before with modernity and the Enlightenment. So is this producing, on the whole, maybe a better outcome as far as Republican arguments go, but maybe it, it lessens the, the, the primacy of well, um, well, uh, like uh, liberal individualism? Yeah. H Hamilton confessed in the, con in, the, in the Constitutional Convention that if it were up to him, he would redraw the boundaries of all the states to make them the same size. Uh -huh. And he said, I just want to get that on the record. You know, basically, he's just getting that on the record. Uh -huh. He says, I know no gentleman here will agree with me, mm -hmm. but here's what I think we should do. <laughs> and, and he just moved on. <clears throat> well, he's right. You can't do that. Um, the, because this is a diverse country and because its diversity to, to a very great degree tracks state boundaries, um, a, a simple, simple majority rule would mean that, you know, California, Chicago, and New York win every election from here on. No, I just, see, we well, don't always agree. Well, that's a little exaggerated. That's a little exaggerated. But you understand the problem. You can have a national majority, numerical majority, popular majority, the, that tends to be from the same, the same large population centers over and over again. And it's not as if California suddenly flips from Democrat to Republican every four years. Um, so, I mean, so federalism, in other words, federalism has a consequence that's a little bit beyond what its original intention was. Yeah, well, that's true. Let's, okay, so the Constitution is also a product of compromises. We know that historically, if you study the Constitution, the notes from the Constitution, we just know this as a matter of fact, because they couldn't get all the states behind it, they couldn't get enough support, so they had to make compromises. Of course, one of the biggest compromises that has to be made is the continuation and perpetuation of slavery, resulting in the 
basically Frith's compromise and, and the Constitution in some ways is founded upon, you know, there's, there's elements of the Constitution that are premised upon the continued exploitation of human beings, right? So what about people that say there's something inherently wrong with the Constitution because that strain, that exploitation is baked into the very Constitution itself, and it didn't solve well, not, some of the biggest problems. Yeah, but, that we're but you're, the you're neglecting the amendment process, and God bless the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments. The, the Constitution without those amendments, uh, you, you'd have to throw away. But also, uh, God bless the Grand Army of the Republic. What? Also bless the Grand Army of the Republic. Yeah, right. I, I mean, mean it, did, it did take a war. It did take a war. Yeah. We, we had, the worst war we actually in the 19th century. Right? The, the, the country didn't just kind of continue. It did take a war, and then we got these crucial amendments to the Constitution that makes the Constitution whole. The, so, um, the argument about slavery almost broke the, con almost broke the convention. Mm -hmm. um, the particular, I think, the, I have to re try to remember this. The particular question was, the, was uh, um, Persons held to service um, who uh, uh, escape from their jobs and cross state lines. Um, uh, what should be done about these people? And this was clearly about slavery. Although there were people who were held to service who were not slaves. They were indentured servants. They had, they had offered to come to, uh, they, they had booked passage to America by promising to work for somebody for a fixed number of years uh, for a very low salary. <laughs> um, so what to, do about, what to do about that? That almost broke the convention up. And, and also, where, when can, can the government ban the importation of slaves? And if so, when? That debate also almost broke the convention. So it was, it was a live issue. It was a live issue. And it was pretty clear during the convention that you know, there, there could be one union or there could be two. Um, Remember, and even the original Constitution didn't guarantee the perpetuation of slavery except where it existed already. Mm -hmm. right? Lincoln's greatest contribution and his party was to say, there's nothing in the Constitution that says uh, new states that are formed can have slavery. It's not there. It's not in the Constitution. And we insist that slavery not be expanded. And they had a powerful constitutional argument. The other side also had some constitutional arguments to make, but I think his were, uh, were, were more impressive. Also, they were careful that the word slave does not appear anywhere in the Constitution. So the Constitution indulges slavery, but I don't quite want to go so far as say it perpetuates it. Um, Woodrow Wilson, of course, president of the United States, but also a political scientist. In fact, the only president who was a political scientist. Thank God. <laughs> so Wilson, you know, is, is a critic, Woodrow Wilson is a critic of the, of the Constitution, right? And Wilson it comes at it from a progressive critique. And he says, listen, OK, these guys got together. They crafted a, a really great system of government for the 1780s, maybe it lasts, it was good for you know, a few decades, but really it's, you know, the Constitution has frozen us in time. It's, it's, it's not a dynamic, it's a static document, it's not a dynamic document, and in actuality we need to really be reinventing ourselves. And it does not solve the problems of modern policy that you know, he was facing, right, the beginning of the birth. Uh, starting the birth of the state, right? And he's frustrated by it. So, you know, what about, you know, Wilson, does he have a point that it was great for a period of time, maybe even an extended period of time, but it doesn't really, it doesn't really match, doesn't have the, the ability to solve the problems of the modern administrative state? Well, what he's really saying is it doesn't allow me to get the Congress to pass any laws that I, I can mm -hmm. think up. Um, it puts limits on me. Mm -hmm. That's what he's saying. Uh, you know, I thought I was going to be the President of the United States, and I, instead I come into office and I discover there's a whole lot of things I can't do. <laughs> well, that's just too goddamn bad. <laughs> um, now, Wilson also believed that 
new times require new constitutions, but he didn't have a particularly strong argument for why that is. In other words, are human beings fundamentally different in 1898 than in 1798? No, they're not. They're not fundamentally different. Some things are different. We have factories. We didn't have factories in 1798, or a few anyway. Um, Jefferson wanted to have a new convention every 13 years. That's what he wrote in a letter to James Madison. Uh, Madison didn't reply. He just <laughs> felt he probably should just let that go and not <laughs> get into a big argument with his pal about that. That, would have, that, that is a terrible idea, and it's important to understand why it's a terrible idea. If you have constant, constant new constitutions, then your politics is constantly um, aimed at your next opportunity to do everything over again. And that's, that's, not, an, that's not a good recipe for a stable um, popular government. Uh, that's, that's, in a way, that's the French disease. That's, that's what happened in France. And, and it seems to me uh, Wilson and contemporary critics make the mistake of thinking that you have to change the Constitution in order to make important policy change. And that's, just, that's empirically not true. I mean, in my lifetime, we've had the 64 Civil Rights <coughs> Act, the 65 Voting Rights Act, We've had Medicare, we've had Medicaid, we've had welfare reform, we've had Obamacare. These are huge statutory <coughs> achievements. Uh, so it's, it's, it's the impatience of, of Woodrow Wilson that's really mistaken. You don't have to change the Constitution to get serious policy change. You just have to get the institutions to be <coughs> Um, the, the mitigated democracy to uh, act. It's going to be slower. The biggest <laughs> criticism we cannot respond to <coughs> is that things are, uh, policy change is slower in the United States than a lot of people would want. That's a price. Or that it is in some other countries. It's a price. Some other democracies. Yeah. But look what we get for that price. We get this remarkable political, <coughs> political stability. Will we have it after uh, next Tuesday? Yeah, we will. We will. How about that? The last critique, um, excuse me, Robert Dahl. <coughs> you know, I got to see a lot of Dahl's lectures in 2001. He was writing, excuse me, his new book on the Constitution. He did it from a comparative perspective. Right. What did Dahl say? Does his comparative critique have any credibility? So, okay, <laughs> there's a background story here. Right? She got her good education at Boston College and then she went to Yale where she <laughs> ran across the likes of Robert Dahl. He makes the fundamental mistake that we've been discussing. You write the Constitution for the people you got. We are not Finland. And maybe we should be, you know, maybe a better, Finland maybe is a better place than the United States. I, mean, I, I don't actually believe it, but let's, for purposes <laughs> of argument, Switzerland, ha Denmark, um, I'm thinking countries that are relatively well governed. Um, and there are a lot fewer than when he wrote the book, because he was touting England and France. I wouldn't give you a nickel for either of those two countries politically right now, even compared to us. So <coughs> he doesn't have the right context for thinking about the problem. And he makes all these comparisons, some of which are now totally anachronistic because the Western European countries have gone downhill politically. Uh, so that's my deepest point. Um, beyond that, you know, he, um, his, his evidence of the superiority of these countries are what I would call strictly social democratic indices. How much is spent on welfare, um, uh, various measures of uh, political participation. 
he ignores uh, all the other kinds of important indices of, of the good life, right? I mean, income. <laughs> this, this country is very high on the per capita income score. Uh, patents, right? We have this incredible technological dyna. We have an ossified constitution and we are the most technologically dynamic country in the world. How about that? Right? There's some, so that's a big fault of, of his. So three things, right? One, he doesn't write, he doesn't understand the American people well enough. Two, um, he uh, overemphasizes the, the high level of good government in other countries. Um, and three, uh, he's very uh, selective in what he thinks are indices of, of success. I studied. <laughs> she sent us the questions in advance. <laughs> <laughs> I studied that chapter. Now, what about the last, I mean, this is not really a critique, but a lot of people say parties didn't exist when you know, in the same way the parties exist today when the Constitution was created. And in fact, many of those who wrote the Constitution were critical of parties and, and what they called faction mm, right. and were, were, were wary of it. So now, of course, we have parties in the United States. So tell us about how parties interact with the Constitution. Do parties inhibit the functioning of the Constitution or frustrate the Constitution is a, is a variable I and mean, they interact, or does it help the, the Constitution to function? Yeah, well, I think, I think there was a learning curve. Um, you know, these are smart people, but they don't know everything. And, and they, they know more next month than they knew last month. And one of the, one of the things that they learned, and by they I mean, you know, uh, Madison, Hamilton, Jefferson, you know, a number of the most prominent individuals, is, is the difference between a faction and a party. So a faction is defined simply by the possession by a number of people of a particular characteristic. They're coal miners or they're businessmen or they're you know, Anglicans. A, a party is, is, a, is, a, is an animal that had to be invented <laughs> in the zoo. <laughs> it wasn't in the, the real zoo, it had to be invented. You have to organize if you want to win an election. Now, this is, we all know this, <laughs> but, you know, oops, it occurred to them at some point, you know what? Madison and, uh, is thinking, we need to go to New England. Jefferson and Madison go on a botany expedition. Bot botanizing expedition. <laughs> botany expedition to New England because they realize they can't, they don't have enough votes <laughs> in, this, in the planter states. They need some northern or middle state votes if they want to capture the White House. So they begin to learn the art of politicking. And so a faction is natural, a party is an invention. Um, and it's an invention that makes government on a scale like this possible. I mean, all modern democracies have discovered this same principle. You, you know, you, you have to organize, and organize means you have a party. And that party has to have leaders, it has to have dues, it has to have money, it has to have a platform that distinguishes it from other parties. It has to have some way of reaching, to, reaching the people and, and, and convincing them that given what we have told you about what we want to do, you're better off with us in an office than with the other guys. It's that simple. But they had to discover it. The great, the great support for the, our two-party system is actually not so much in the Constitution as it is in our just adopting the British practice of first past the post. So if you're either going to win or lose, I don't care if it's a congressional election, a gubernatorial election, uh, uh, or a presidential election uh, in most states, um, 
you have to have a majority. Right? In other systems, and, and um, ones that I would not urge us to adopt, like Israel, which unfortunately I'm a great supporter of Israel, but their governmental system is dreadful, right? Because it encourages every, you know, you and I could start a party and we'll get a few votes in the Knesset and maybe that way when the Knesset is tied, they'll have to come to us and we can say things like, well, there'll be no uh, bus travel on Saturday, even if 90% of the country wants bus travel on Saturday. So the two-party system is particularly beneficial for sustaining a democratic republic. The system is in decline. We're in terrible trouble with our parties. They used to be much more locally focused. They used to be federations of state parties and therefore they were controlled not by any one individual but by people who got the unfortunate name of bosses. I don't call them bosses, I call them barons. And so the barons had to get together from, you know, Philadelphia and Chicago and New York to take the Democrats, Philadelphia, Chicago and New York, uh, southern states, and, and figure out who did they want to run. And of course, they're because they were professionals, their great interest was in running someone who could win. I don't think whichever party you are affiliated with, I don't think you could say that your candidate was the, was the candidate who could most easily win this presidential election. It, it isn't so. We've developed uh, largely through a, a whole series of reforms in how in, 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 that encourage primaries and caucuses. We, we destroyed this sense of a kind of sensible deliberation about who we should run. And uh, maybe some of you are enthusiastic about these candidates. I confess I'm not. Uh, and I'd like to, I wish we had smoke-filled rooms. We're never going to go back to that. So I'm not saying this is not a plea for reform, but it's a, un, partly an understanding of why we're not in a great place. It's not the Constitution. Yeah, these were sold as democratic reforms, but they have, among, besides that outcome, they have made political campaigns more expensive than they ever were in history. Um, and not just because of inflated money. It, it, that's in real, real terms. Uh, because if, if you have to go fishing for votes instead of having um, party leaders in the states who can organize the campaign for you and bring out their voters, who, who they know pretty well, you have to get to the voters by TV and other forms of mass communication. All of that costs money. So, so. In the book, you, you have the critiques, you answer the critiques, you talk about um, the value of uh, thinking about the Constitution in this holistic way. Would you say the book is, do you think, find it to be, is it a hopeful book? Um, <laughs> trust in government is, <coughs> excuse me, at low levels. But is this a hopeful book? And can you talk about what would be some of practical considerations that might alleviate some of these critiques that are leveled against the Constitution, which I think you both said here tonight, aren't necessarily, these are things that irritate people but may not have the origins in the Constitution itself, but sort of how the extra constitutional system has grown up around it. Well, you know, what your teacher, we're teachers. <laughs> so we, we, we give a lecture and uh, we know who we're talking to, or we think we have an idea about who who the audience for a book like this might be. And we're trying to persuade them um, to, 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 to identify some problems that they might not have thought about. Um, and, and, and that, you know, from, that, that's the most really that a book can do. W will it have any impact? Well, honestly, probably not. Uh, uh, to have a big change in the way people think about politics is going to require something more than 
our book, somebody else's book, a few other books, it's going to require some statesmanship on the part of some as yet unknown <laughs> um, arrival on the political scene, someone who is <laughs> not currently uh, involved at any high level. And we can hope that over the next election cycles, maybe that'll happen. I would say where we are most um, pessimistic mm -hmm. um, is about the Congress. I think the state federalism, I think, is relatively alive. And uh, by the way, so many states are, have much better chief executives than we tend to get at the presidential level. Um, yeah, that wasn't always true. That wasn't always true, but it's true. I it's think true it's now, true yeah. now. But the Congress has to retake its primacy. I mean, in the, in, in the writing of the Constitution, the, the essential idea is that the, we were um, a place governed by the rule of law and laws made by the Congress. Right? Instead of being this kind of presidential uh, kind of uh, uh, elected monarchy system that we seem to be moving toward. Now that requires somehow a regeneration of the Congress, right? right. The Congress these days uh, is dominated in both, on both sides by what, that wonderful term virtue signaling. Well, I don't want virtue signaling. I want people being elected who can sit down around a room, figure out what they disagree with, figure out where there might be room for compromise or some other way of doing things that would satisfy both parties, uh, that's going to take, um, <coughs> I think, the public. The public has to get smarter. And that, sh that shouldn't be impossible. I mean, it, it's, uh, it really is at the citizen level that things have to improve. There are no policies that are going to radically change where we are. Yuval Levin, who you're having later, has some wonderful sm small ideas and, and press him on his small ideas. They're good small ideas, but they're not, you know, he doesn't pretend they're going to. No, there has to be a national conversation about what, you know, what we're about, what do we care about, how can we find more common ground. So our book is a, you know, a drop in the bucket, but it, it, I'm a little more cheerful than Dennis, uh, perhaps. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have questions from the audience? Uh, yes. I think at one point. Yeah, you, use you, the mic, please. I don't hear okay. very well. At one point, you mentioned that uh, the Constitution indulges slavery. I, I, I remember reading someplace that in the earlier drafts, they actually didn't say it wasn't a euphemistic three-fifths person. They actually mentioned slavery. Is that true, and, then, and did it change? Yeah, it, it, there, 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 there was a, a number of anti-slave members of the convention um, who, among other things, this wasn't their only idea, wanted to make sure that the word slave did not appear in the Constitution, because that would appear to endorse slavery. Now, looking back on this, we could say this is a quibble, <laughs> you know, given the reality of slavery. Um, why does it matter whether you call people slaves or uh, people bound to servitude? Everybody knows what you're talking about, right? Be that as it may, they, some, the leaders of the convention, were certain that they did not want the word slave to appear in the Constitution because it would seem, therefore, to, that the Constitution itself would be giving sanction to slavery. Um, and then there was the conflict over when would the importation of slaves be banned. And, you know, the Confederate or the, 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 the planter states wanted, you know, no limit on the importation of slaves. Um, the anti-slave states wanted immediate secession, and so they compromised on 1820. So that's another compromise. Uh, 1808, no? 
uh, yeah, yeah. So I mean, that's that's a that's a considerable period of time, but it's it's not forever, which is what the other side wanted. Uh, no limits ever. And this is so important for Lincoln because he can play on that when, when he makes the rhetorical case for uh, not allowing slavery to expand. He can say, "See, we didn't. It's not a slave document. There were some certain decisions made." Uh, but the word slavery never appears because the the framers uh, were not pro slavery. They did or not. Some want of them to, were. Yeah, some they did not want were. to. They did not want the Constitution to appear to endorse slavery. Get the mic. Thanks for coming tonight. It's a great discussion. I'm struck by the observation that you know on the left, as you pointed out tonight, we've had these deep seated critiques of the Constitution, you know, let's call them strident, you know, they're so, the, prop, the Constitution is so problematic, we need utterly transformative change. <clears throat> that would be, let's call it shocking and decisive and again strident. On the right, in recent years, over the last several years, many years, there's kind of been this idea of a Madison, Madisonian convention and kind of this unused constitutional clause to have this convention where you would be able to pass an amendment that solved everything all at once, which arguably could be said to be strident. It would be shocking to half the country. It would be decisive. It would be uh, unexpected. And yet both sides haven't prevailed. And so I'm wondering if that's, if you have any observation on that, that maybe it's a cause for optimism that both extremes have not gotten what they wanted, which is this quick fix, kind of get around some norms, even if they abide by the clause. Uh, and so the center no, holds, maybe. The dumbest decisions politically that, that have happened happened in the two political parties when they uh, claimed to democratize the nominee. When, when they encouraged people of the same party to eat each, eat each other's livers. I mean, is this, is this really a good way to govern a country that you're a Democrat, I'm a Democrat, but we, we both want to be senator from wherever, so we're going to just tear each other apart and destroy each other's character. It's just, it, it, it's insane. We, we have done so far a very good job of protecting the Constitution. And it is hard to change. Thank you. Uh, thank you. You mentioned the first past the post voting decision there have it's my view that the lubricant for our various con constructed institutions is voting. And a reform that is slowly creeping across the country is ranked choice voting, which means we don't have the binary, you're in or out. Yeah. What's your view of the role of voting and particularly voting reform? I, I, I think the republic is best sustained by two-party politics, and so I'm against rank, rank voting. Mm. I, I think yeah. it, it gets us in that other direction, that same direction that proportional representation takes us. So it's very trendy right now. Again, the law schools are full of it, and uh, some states have gone that way. Cambridge. Okay. <laughs> Cambridge. Remember, we live in Boston, so Cambridge. <laughs> Cambridge, you don't know the result of the election. Two weeks, two three weeks. weeks two yeah. weeks it takes to go through the ranks. And New York suffered from that, too. It took, but isn't uh, that still a first-past-the-post principle, but the calculation to get first-past-the-post is more, is more, you know, is by, by intensity well, of references? <clears throat> well, there's no parties. So you, you just, everybody runs individually. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not that a Democrat beats a Republican. That means there's there seven or eight or ten candidates. This is how it works for the Cambridge City Council. Uh -huh. For every open seat, there's several candidates. Right. The political science that you and I both studied mm -hmm. uh, was so strong on the virtue of the two-party principle right. that by, by being a member of a party, uh, you, had some, you had something to attach to that made some sense to you other than the personality of... I mean, you know, the personalities of politicians, you don't want, you, you know, it's like, you, you don't want to dig too deeply into that. Uh, but, but if you are part of a party, you have some sense of what the overall meaning of the party is. And 
if you're, if you're on the outs, you organize to get in. And the, the sheer simplicity of it is highly democratic. The, the incredible difficulty that we go through choosing our candidates. What do we know about these people? What about ranked choice voting in a primary? See what well, I mean? I hate primaries so much, I don't know, oh, yeah. know how to how to reform them. I'm, I'm, I understand what you're saying. You need multiple candidates to, to yeah. for ranked choice to make yeah, sense. So numerically, it usually is more than one party and it's people vying. But I just wonder in a primary if that would moderate, attenuate the, the more extremist elements when you have in a primary electorate, you're going to typically have the, the turnout is going to be people that are going to feel intensity of preferences. Yeah. Well, so wouldn't ranked choice moderate and intensity you of You opened my mind. You opened my mind. <laughs> I, I, you might be right about that. Yeah, right. maybe, you maybe. Right. Right. Well, ranked choice voting in Cambridge produces city councils that are very different from the, the overall from the from a, a city itself. Uh-huh. Uh, they from all, they, a traditional plurality yeah. vote. Uh-huh. Yeah, they all tend to be, you know, liberals. <laughs> you know? And right. Cambridge is a liberal city, of course. There's a lot of liberals. I mean, there's a lot of people in Cambridge who are not liberals. Um, so uh, rank, rank choice voting seems to give the edge to the people who are the best organized, um, which is not, you know, the, the worst sin in the world, but it's, it's um, uh, let's say it's, it's, a, it's a form of election that lawyers understand better than anybody else. <laughs> also, you can't have ranked choice voting, right, in, and maintain districts. You could, uh, you'd have ranked choice in every district? Yeah, you would, yeah right. I mean, it depends on what, you're, what the election is for. Right? Yeah, it depends what it's yeah. for. I mean, I, it's much more I'm so I'm elections, so in favor but, of district-wide elections, uh -huh, again, right. because a district means something. It's, it's relatively yeah. small. People can... Uh, uh, have some reasonable notion of civic friendship among them. Right, and, right. And, and, and they tend to have similar problems. Whereas the city, say, a city the size of Cambridge already, you know, people from North Cambridge, or they don't have anything to do with people from, from East Cambridge. That's right. Yeah, they, have, they, have, yeah, they face different kinds of challenges. Yeah. yeah. Other, any other questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, oh Steve. And okay. Announce yourself. <laughs> Tell them who you are. Uh, I'm Steve Smith, and just recently uh, retired as the executive director of the American Political Science Association, and longtime friend of, uh, of Mark and, and Colleen, and, and I've known Dennis too through your writings as well. So, um, so I it this has also reminded me of my career, and I remember when I started in graduate school in the early '80s. You know, this was in the wake of Jimmy Carter's presidency, and there was a widespread per perception in political science, if you remember, that, that there was a feeling that Carter's was regarded as a kind of failed presidency, and the, there was a diagnosis that the, it was the political system. There was a lot of thinking that, well, maybe uh, we needed to adopt some kind of parliamentary system with strong parties, and, and the reason that Carter was ineffective was we have this kind of weak presidential system. You know, Richard Neustadt's work, you know, kind of reinforced that at that time. And, and, and so, if you think about the last 40 plus years, we've seen a, a growing powers of the presidency. There was a big debate during George Bush's presidency in the Iraq war and all of that. And, and so you've seen growing presidential power, you see many law professors and political scientists arguing that the kind of, the, of uh, taking an expansive view of what the Constitution allows in terms of the presidential powers. And, and, um, and I guess I'm curious about, because I think some of the people who, political scientists as well as others who are worried about the future of the American democracy are worried that the what we regarded as the kind of guardrails in the Constitution on presidential power have been eroded, really? and, and, and what can we do to um, prevent that erosion and, you know, short of some constitutional convention or amending the Constitution. I mean, what, yeah. we're, we're at a point now where those guardrails have eroded, and again, right. it's not, I mean, this, is, also this has been something that's happened over a period, many, many years. So I guess I'd be curious about your thoughts about 
So the, those guardrails in the Constitution and, and the issues around presidential power. The greatest guardrail against excessive executive power is the United States Congress. They're full of power that they don't exercise. I mean, uh, my colleague Shep Melnick has written this great stuff about how it, uh, Congress has ceded to executive agencies and the courts uh, whole, whole revisions of policy um, that are not in the statute. Statutes are often rather guarded and executive agencies expand on them and the courts let them, but of course Congress could stop all this. So we don't need to do anything to the Constitution, but we have to stick a needle in the U.S. Congress to, to do it, to take responsibility for a, a major role in governing the country. That, that's what I would say. I, I agree with all those concerns. There, there are political scientists on the other side. Howell and, uh, what's his name, uh, uh, Terry Moe wanted just uh, virtually abolish the Congress and just <laughs> left the president. So. Um, uh, yeah, they've probably changed their mind by and now. They're members of, <laughs> and they're members of your association. So, um, no, I, I totally what, what agree. The, the presidency is, is off the rails right, in so is, many ways. Is the resources, though, Steve, that are provided, you know, I worked in the legislative branch and I worked in the executive branch, but the legislative branch is tiny compared to the executive branch. So what Professor Landy is saying, when there's vacuums and there's, there's you know, um, vague statutes that are written or, you know, uh, places that authority is not outlined. When, when there's vacuums for, for, for power fill. and authority, someone will fill, right? Exactly. You taught that seminar on authority, right? Right, when I was a senior, right? Like, it, it, things, it seems that there, someone will fill the vacuums and, and the holes of authority. That's just what power is. That's how politics works. I agree. And, and you can give, but Congress might be inclined to do that, but you don't have anywhere near the staff or the expertise to be able to write the laws in the way that would be more specific, that would then, I would think, narrow down the vacuum of, of power that would pr provide less discretion on the executive, so you, we would, ha you know, we would have to be okay with doing that, with, with providing more resources for Congress to feel like they were able to do that. And the greatest statement of of this matter uh, is Federalist Fifty One, right? That each branch has to recognize its own ambition, its yeah. ambition, fighting ambition, and the Congress seems to have lost its amb. The courts have plenty of ambition. The presidents are on steroids with ambition. Where's the Congress uh, to countervail? Not in the name of uh, uh, sainthood, but in the name of a kind of institutional interest and constitutional concern about curbing, in some ways, both the courts and the, con and the president. It's bad. I'd like to continue that down that road a little bit. So I worked for Congress for many, many years in the Appropriations Committee and other places. And oh. um, there are a lot of powers inherent under the Constitution to Congress, but I would argue in some ways that the changes in the nation, modern communication, the, the forms of campaigning that we've done, all of those things have, have, have put barricades up to congressional power that they're not, not gonna over, I mean, it's nice to sit here and say Congress just needs to assert itself but they can't assert themselves. You have a, uh, you know, we've talked about the Constitution and the presidency, and the point of the Constitution was con to constrain a strong monarch, you know, that yeah. sort of thing, and in some ways we've reverted, I, I mean, uh, political scientists for years have talked about a strong presidency in the yin and yang between Congress and the presidency, but I would start to argue that we're reverting back to a norm of a, of a strong autocrat, a monarch, or whatever, without the ability to constrain that under the Constitution. I mean, does, can the Constitution, can, in our current political environment where individual members of Congress have to stand up and, and you know, fight an onslaught of 40 or 50 million dollars to win a two-year term in office and, you know, do the things they have to do, can they stand up to a presidency? Well, can you have a... See, I'm, not, I'm the optimist in this room, not, not, not this guy. Um, it, it's, very, it's a very tough, 
the odds are stacked against, but uh, it has to happen, and, and it could happen. I mean, there, there, there has been a certain kind of absence of real um, uh, uh, real, am real push by members of Congress. Um, I, I had the good fortune to know uh, Congressman Bowling from Kansas, from uh, the Kansas side of uh, Kansas City, uh, and he said, you know, and he always ran. He said, you know, I'm just not afraid. What are they going to do? Beat me? Is that the end of the world? Am I going to starve to death if I'm not in Congress? And so Bo uh, Congressman Bowling, who was head of the Rules Committee when Tip O'Neill was uh, Speaker, I've always been imbued by that. Why uh, is it really so bad to lose an election if, if, the, if the fate of the republic is at stake? Come on, guys and gals. Mm -hmm. Stick your neck out. Last question, thank you. So to, to, I guess, continue that a step further, <clears throat> you know, some people, a lot of people, consider uh, George Washington to be a, a hero uh, because after serving eight years, two terms, he chose to walk away. And he didn't have to. And then, you know, years later, FDR wins his fourth term and passes away you know, shortly thereafter, and then the, the amendment is going to put term limits in yeah. place for that particular branch. I was wondering if you guys would just comment on your thoughts about maybe the founders missing out on an opportunity to put term limits in place for all of the branches from the beginning, which might give what you're talking about, congressmen that don't have the courage to step up to save the republic. Um, I, you know, when, you, when you're worried about winning an election, that can sap your courage to take a stand. But you have to weigh that. I, I, you, you, there's a lot to what you say, but you have to weigh that against the fact that you know, really good Congress people, they develop all kinds of expertise and knowledge and they're, they can be very tough. Uh, uh, and I think my great fear about term limits, if they're, unless they're very long, then I don't care. 12, you want to have 12 year term limits, I'm not going to lose any sleep over that. It's going to transfer power to the staffs. The Congress people aren't going to know their way to the men's room or women's room, mm -hmm. and the staffs will will make will just tell them what to do. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but you see my point. Staffs are very powerful. Staffs do many wonderful things, but they're nobody elected them. So that's always been my worry about term limits. That the the staffs with you you'd get that kind of government. Yeah, the but permanent, many, but your points staff. are good ones. Yeah, your points are good ones. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you so much for attending this wonderful discussion. Well, you guys we are the home fun. of the Constitution, so it seems to make sense to engage in a defense of That's American a, yeah. constitutionalism. So if you haven't read the book, I urge you to take a look at it. Uh, we, uh, Professor Landy and Professor Hale are going to sign some books here. So they will be on sale downstairs in the store if you come back and we will have them. So thank you so much for attending this evening. And we'll be back in, I think in December, we're going to have another book talk uh, and continue our series in 2025 as well. Thank you. Thank you for being such a good audience. You guys are great.